Well, hello. Welcome to Governor's Ag Conference uh, here, meeting for the 27th annual uh, Governor's Ag Conference. I'm Johnny Ferentz. I'm a junior uh, at UNL, majoring in agricultural education, and I'm from the great town of Ord. <laughs> and I am Trent Musney, a junior at UNL studying agronomy. I'm from Howells, Nebraska, and Johnny and I serve as head counselors on the Nebraska Ag Youth Council, uh, commonly referred to as the NAYC. Many of you are familiar with the NAYC, but for those of you who are not, uh, the council is comprised of 21 college-age men and women with a passion for the agricultural industry, chosen to represent the, department, the Nebraska Department of Agriculture. Throughout the year, the members of the NAYC work to educate youth about the agricultural industry through elementary school visits, our urban youth farm tours, and through the Nebraska Agricultural Youth Institute, or also known as NAYI. NAYI is a five-day summer program where current juniors and seniors in high school, uh, they come down to the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, learn more about the ag industry, how to advocate for that industry, and careers available in agriculture. Uh, many of you have attended NAYI this past year, and we're really pleased to see you again. When Governor Ricketts approached the Nebraska Department of Agriculture about hosting a youth-focused meeting at Governor's Ag Conference, we were happy to assist. What a privilege it is for all of us to have this personal opportunity with the governor today. We, all, we encourage all of you to take an active role in today's discussion. Uh, ask questions and uh, voice your opinions. Uh, we'll be asking the governor questions uh, through our live tweet feed over here. Uh, so if you have a question, please uh, tweet and hashtag AskGovRicketts. This is also a wonderful opportunity for our friends that are tuning in via the live web stream to interact with the governor. So let us know your questions you have. And again, use that hashtag, AskGovRicketts. With that, it's my pleasure, pleasure to welcome Governor Pete Ricketts to the stage to open our discussion. Please join me in welcoming Governor Pete Ricketts. All right, well, because I like causing trouble, I'm gonna come down off the stage and uh, chat a little bit down here because I think it's, uh, it'll be easier to ask questions. We're gonna keep the panel up there for the time being. Uh, and maybe we just keep up there the whole time, who knows? But uh, thank you all very much for coming here today. I am, and for those of you who are joining us uh, remotely as well, we appreciate your participation, being able to make this as interactive as possible is one of our goals. And so please take advantage of the opportunity to ask questions later as we get going. And certainly to all of you here in the audience. Uh, I am excited to have all of you here today. You know, you are the future of our state. And you probably hear that all the time, but it's absolutely true. You know, if you look at our state, we have more producers over the age of 65 than we do under the age of 45. And if we're going to continue to grow our state, we need young people to get involved in agriculture. You know, agriculture is the largest industry we have here in the state. Uh, over one, it's a 25% of our economy. And if we're going to grow Nebraska, which is what I want to do in my administration, we have to grow agriculture. That's our largest industry. It's not a lot of rocket science here. It's our largest industry. If we're going to grow the state, we've got to grow agriculture. And so that's why I'm excited to have you all here today to talk about how young people can get involved in agriculture. Now, uh, I'm also excited because if you look at the trends of where we're going in agriculture, they're absolutely on our side. I'm going to actually steal these numbers that I'm about to give you from Ronnie Green, who presented them last year at the Governor's Ag Conference. Last year, he was here and he was talking about the trends in the world. That by 2050, there will be 2 billion more people on the face of the earth. And because of rising standards of living, we will have to produce 100% more food. 70% of that will have to come from productivity and innovation. Well, folks, we sit in the middle of the most productive, innovative country the world's ever seen. Our farmers and ranchers are the most productive people in the world. We're ideally situated right here in Nebraska to be able to take advantage of that. But as you all know, you can't do that without people. And that's why I'm so excited to have you all here to talk about the career opportunities we have available in agriculture in this state today. 
because we need people like you to be involved, to be able to come into the industry to help us grow our state. See, one of my goals is to be able to grow the state so we can create even better futures for the people that are here today. And that's you. And so I want to make sure that you have the opportunities to be able to stay here in the state, that we can attract people from around the country to come here and make Nebraska home. That's how we're going to grow. So thank you very much for coming and taking time. I know that it's tough to pull time away from classes sometimes, or maybe you're actually really glad you get a chance to get away from it. Uh, maybe you don't have homework assignments that you have to do for tomorrow. But I know my kids are always happy when they get out of class. But uh, I appreciate you taking the time to do this here today because it's very important. And we're certainly looking for your feedback and your questions. Now, what I'd like to do right now is introduce our panelists. Uh, I'm going to start with John. Okay, it's, it's spelled Brabeck, but pronounced Brebitz. Don't, he, he'll, I'm going I'm to introduce everybody, and then you'll get a chance to talk. How's that? Okay. So he's, he's, a, he's in sales with uh, Frontier Co-op. We also have Emily Thornburg. Uh, oh, so John is a graduate of Northeastern Community College. Emily is a uh, graduate of the University of Nebraska, and she is working in communications with the Nebraska Corn Board. And then we've got Austin Zimmerman, who is a graduate of University of Nebraska as well, and uh, in en an engineer for AGI, uh, I'm sorry, AGI, I'm, so, I'm sorry, GSI. GSI, GSI, Agriculture, GSI Ag, sorry. Sorry for getting those letters confused. I'm a little dyslexic sometimes. <laughs> so they're going to be our panelists. They're going to talk a little bit about uh, their careers, and then what we'll do is we'll open up to questions and answers and just start talking about whatever you want to talk about. You can direct questions to me, you can direct questions to them and uh, we'll take it from there. So with that, John, I'm going to turn now turn it over to you. My last name is always a little tricky to say, so I always just tell people, just say Brayback, it's easier. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Rubitz. I am the Senior Vice President of Frontier Cooperative. Um, I reside in Wahoo, Nebraska with my wife, Michelle, who's a nurse. We have uh, two daughters, Ashlyn, four, and Evelyn, 18 months. I'm the youngest of five kids, raised on a family farm near Clarkson, Nebraska. I graduated in 2000 from Clarkson High School and 02 from Northeast Community College. I received a uh, agronomy degree and took classes for ag transfer. In January before graduation, I lined up an internship with Frontier Co-op, and upon graduation, I started in David City, Nebraska. In August, Frontier offered me a full-time position in sales slash operations. I, already in, I was already enrolled at UNL, but I chose to stay. My position was sales most of the year until spring, and then I would help with fertilizer season. Here's where I really started to use what I learned in college. A few key college experiences that really helped me were my soils and lab classes. I was also able to participate in NACTA. My passion has always been around soils and plants, so it was a natural fit for me to try and provide a farmer with several options of how to be more profitable per acre. There's an important part to that sentence, provide options, not tell a farmer how to do it. After all, some of these farmers have been doing this for over 40 years. In September 04, I was promoted to seed manager and I moved to the Mead location. I remember being really excited about this position, but also nervous. I had never really seen all the components and numbers that make a business function. Fortunately for me, I've always been a numbers guy. I'm not going to lie, I'm more of a swag kind of numbers guy, but with a little extra time, I can be pretty precise. The biggest challenge for me was Frontier's seed business was basically non-existent and a non-player, not only in the company, but also in the marketplace. In 06, I was faced with another really big challenge. Frontier had a large growth, had large consecutive growths in our seed business, but overall our agronomy business was going down. It really bothered me, and for a while, I thought I needed to find a different company to work for. Instead, I met with the GM and also the board of directors. I presented to them that we needed to start not only focusing on good service and facilities, but also hiring good individuals to go out and call on farmers. That turned out to be a great move, as Frontier Co-op would not be what it is today had we not adapted our business model and developed a new culture. Over the next few years, my roles continued to change from seed manager to sales manager and marketing manager. 
in the last two years, I have since added in a sales manager to work with our sales agronomist and also a marketing coordinator to promote our whole company. Currently, I'm the senior vice president of Frontier Co-op. I'm still very passionate about agronomy, but have expanded my horizons and been involved in all divisions of the company. What's crazy to me is it seems like yesterday I was just sitting in your guys' chairs. I often think about my career and what, what would have, how things could have been different had I not went to NECC or if I would have gone on to the U in August of 02. Lucky for me, I had several teachers and educational experiences that led me down this path. Thanks everyone for coming today too. everyone. I'm Emily Thornburg and first of all I'm really excited to be here today so thank you all for coming and thank you for having me. Um, it wasn't that long ago that I was in your shoes so it's exciting to be here and speak with all of you today so if you have any questions at all don't hesitate to ask any of us up here on the panel. So I'm the director of communications um, as he said at the Nebraska Corn Board um, and in this position, communications is pretty um, wide-ranging, so I get to work on behalf of Nebraska's 23,000 corn farmers in a variety of different ways, but I thought I would just highlight a couple of the more cool things, if you will, that I get to do in my position. So one of the things is I run all the social media channels and platforms for the corn board, so Five years ago, if you would have told me that I was going to tweet and post for my job someday, I probably would have laughed at you and said, we can't get on Facebook at work. But uh, social media is a really important part of the industry today, and it's a really neat part of my job that I'm excited to be able to do. Um, another thing that I do is I'm in charge of our internship program. So we have six different internships at the Nebraska Corn Board. So when you get to that age in college and you're looking for internships, be sure to look us up. I'm in charge of recruitment and hiring and then mentoring those interns as we go through the summer and the year. And one of our interns is here today, so I want to make sure I call her out. She's a great intern and doing an awesome job. Morgan Zump down there, if you want to raise your hand. She works with us at the Corn Board and is outstanding, so I just had to embarrass her a little bit and call her out. Um, the other things that I do in my job, I coordinate all of our events, outreach events, and then advertising PR, whether that's working with Husker Sports and doing different advertising with them, our PR and publications that we put out in newspapers on the radio, you name it. So that's kind of the highlights of what I'm doing now, but to kind of dive back at my background and kind of tell you how I got to where I am. Um, so I grew up on the family farm in Geneva, and like many of you, well, first of all, how many of you are in high school right now? Raise of hands. Okay, and then college in here? Okay, so we have a really good mix. Okay, so I grew up on the family farm, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you grew up on the family farm too, and from when I was really young, loved agriculture and knew that's what I wanted to do someday. So throughout my childhood and high school, 4-H, FFA, that was a major part of what I did when I was younger and kind of set the road and the path to where I am today, but another really important thing, and this is kind of a shameless plug for all of you in green, but when I was in high school, a thing that I went to, NAYI, um, was amazing and it really changed my perspective on what I wanted to do in the future and for my career. So all of you that are in high school, if you have that opportunity and can attend and apply for NAYI, I definitely encourage you to. It's it's such a good opportunity. You can go two years in high school and it opens your eyes to not only opportunities in the egg um, for an egg career, but opens your eyes to all your peers across the state who also have similar interests of agriculture. So great, great opportunity. And so I loved NAYI so much that I could hardly even wait to graduate high school. Went to college and was very involved on NAYC, so I was one of these students running around in the green polo at Governor's Egg Conference only four or five years ago, but um, that really changed my perspective on what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to make ice cream for a living when I was in high school, then I went to NAYI and realized I like communications and I love, well, I didn't know I was gonna be on the corn board someday, but I love talking and I love just communicating, and so that's really where that light bulb moment happened and where I kind of got to where I am today. But a couple other tips that helped me in college to get to where I am today. 
A couple things was diversifying myself. So this is applicable to high school too for you guys that are still in high school. If you like agriculture, don't just tunnel vision and stay in ag, and that's something I did in college too. It's important to make all those connections and um, really meet your peers in the industry, but you need to step outside that box too and meet other people that don't know much about agriculture because you're going to see them as you work in your career and beyond high school and college. And so those connections are really important for me through high school and college, and I would encourage all of you to get involved with whatever that might be to make those other connections also. And then the last thing, and I'm sure you've all heard of it, but internships. That was a huge piece to my success and how I got to where I am. Um, and diversify yourself in that too. I was an agribusiness major at the University of Nebraska, and I did a grain merchandising internship. I went into that and I knew nothing other than that I worked at ADM and I was gonna be buying corn and soybeans. Beyond that, that, that was a huge learning curve, but really opened my eyes and my understanding for the commodity industry. And then I did other internships in sales and marketing. And so when you're in college and you get to that age, really make sure you take time to apply and make those connections and opportunities because you learn so much in your classes in college and throughout that whole experience, but the knowledge and the networking that you gain from your internships really is something that you're not going to gain in the classroom. And so that's something that really helped me get to where I am today. So I graduated about two years ago. I'm only 23, so I'm obviously just into my career, but um, a lot of what I did in college and in high school helped get me to where I am today. So good work, keep it up, and let me know if you guys have any questions. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Austin Zimmerman, as he said. I'm currently a design engineer for GSI and AP Cumberland, which it's a global company that specializes in making grain bins and other various livestock equipment. Uh, I just want to start out by saying thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. You know, thank you for being here. Thank you for investing in yourself. I don't know if you guys have ever heard it worded like that, but really that's what you guys are doing here. You're investing in yourselves, right? You're learning. You're learning from our great governor, uh, hearing from other people that are kind of going through or have gone through the same things you guys are going through. And I applaud you guys for that. Continue to do that. Continue to grow and develop yourself. And wh where you guys are at right now is a good place to start. You know, FFA, 4-H, NAYI, all of those activities are a great base for you guys to start investing in yourself and continuing to develop your skills, your, your knowledge, and your experience. Um, it doesn't seem like that long ago. I was kind of in the same shoes as a lot of you, uh, going through 4-H, FFA, striving for the American degree, uh, all those things, all those good things. And I just want you guys to continue to do that because you guys have no idea how important that is for your future. Um, and so that's something, guys, anybody can't take away from you. It's something you always have, something you can keep in your back pocket and uh, keep with you, I guess, for from moving forward. Um, you know, going back to, I grew up on a pig farm, small pig farm uh, here in small town Nebraska, and I never would have thought necessarily that I would be where I am today, but it's just from building on those experiences. Um, one thing I'd like to go back to, like in high school, for instance, um, one year our high school didn't have enough money to hire a DJ for for uh, one of our school dances. So fun fact about me is I started DJing a little bit in high school, you know, and I never would have thought that it would continue to grow. I thought it was just kind of a short-term thing, but it's still, the company's still going today and it's, you know, continue, continuing to grow. So you never know what kind of opportunity is going to arise. You know, you just kind of got to go with it. And heck, it sounds kind of funny to say, like, a pig farmer from Nebraska owns a DJ company and you know, wants to be an engineer, it doesn't sound like it fits together, it doesn't sound like it goes together, even saying it sounds weird, you know, but that's the great thing, it doesn't have to fit. Um, there's so many opportunities out there for you guys uh, to just grasp and, and go for it, and I'm not trying to steal a theme by anything, but, uh, you know, and I'm not a Dodge guy, but grab life by the horns and go with it, <laughs> and just, uh, just kind of got to roll with the punches and, and keep your eyes open for different opportunities, because 
you never know what's going to come up your way. You've got to kind of pursue them and, and go after them. Um, kind of going back to some of my experiences, uh, going into college, I had had enough experience on the farm of realizing of things not working the way I wanted them to and thinking that there's better ways to make stuff. So that's where I got the idea to become an ag engineer. And uh, so I pursued that at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Uh, my first year there, I was also an intern at the Nebraska Corn Board. Must be a good place to start, I don't know. But it, uh, they treated me really well there. I learned a lot and gained experience that I, you know, I can't replace. And you know, that was kind of a good stepping stone because I wanted to continue to be active throughout college, just like you guys are right now. Um, and I wanted to continue to grow off of that. So I joined other clubs such as the meat judging team, livestock judging team, quarter scale. And that's the beauty about college, you know, there's so many different activities you guys can do that are focused on what you want to do. So I would encourage you guys to pursue some of those opportunities. Um, and I never knew where that was going to take me. You know, I had engineering professors that were looking at me thinking I was crazy for wanting to join the meat judging team, you know, and how is that going to help me and benefit me for my future. But, uh, and I didn't know at the time, but it opened several opportunities for me. That following summer, um, I got an offer for an internship with Cargill at the world's second largest uh, pork processing facility in Beardstown, Illinois. And right off the bat, I had a, you know, I had a one-up. I had an advantage because I was, had some knowledge in, in that background. I knew the goods and the bads and what needed to happen. So that also opened another opportunity for me while I was there. Um, they, I never would have thought when I became an engineer that as an intern, I would be able to spend five million dollars that wasn't mine on a project that I did in a summer. You know, it's just crazy things like that that you never know where it's going to take you, uh, and you just kind of got to go with it. But that was just another stepping stone for me, and continued to to diversify. And so, that's the beauty about internships. And I know she's talked about that a little bit, and I want to continue to press on that. But internships and summer jobs and co-ops stuff like that. They're great ways to try out opportunities for you guys. I mean, you're not permanently pressed down to any kind of job for the rest of your life. It's, it's something you can try out and, and give it a shot. And so I think you know, internships are a great way to gain experience and, and, and learn from those. So I wanted to do something different in my next internship. Um, I wanted to do something to see what was more of my path and what I fit better. Uh, moving forward, so I took an internship with GSI, which is a company out of Illinois. I lived out there for a summer, and that was a completely different internship. It was more of design and testing, and versus where Cargill was more manufacturing or more uh, process flow, I guess, as you will. And I used those knowledge, that knowledge and experience to move on. So I was very blessed, you know, going into into call or going into graduation with having you know, several different job offers and opportunities just off of the experiences that I had gained through various organizations like you guys are in. Um, and needless to say, I took a job with ADM right out of college at an ethanol plant. And I learned a lot of things being there, but I come to find out shortly after that wasn't for me. And luckily enough, I had another opportunity back at GSI. And so, for the past about year and a half at GSI and AP, um, I've been on projects designing grain bins, uh, designing hog feeders, multiple different livestock equipment. And going into that, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what opportunities were going to be there. Um, I didn't know that something that I would design would be sold to thousands of people and sold on every continent of the world. It's just, you never know what type of opportunities you guys are going to have. So just go out there and take them and, and go after them. And, you know, some people think that you, you got to get a little lucky to get where you want to be. Um, I'm a firm believer that you're only as lucky as the hard work you put into it. So I want you guys to think about that a little bit. And uh, I want to thank Kristen and the Governor for having us today and allowing us to speak to you guys. And hope you guys have a good rest of the week. All right. Well, thank you very much, panelists. You know, a couple things struck me as, as you all were talking. One is that, uh, just kind of Austin following up what you were talking about, is 
you know, you don't always necessarily have a plan for how things are going to lay out and it's going to all fall, fall out neatly. You know, I went uh, undergraduate and was a biology major. I started off working in a protein biochemistry lab studying lysosomal enzyme storage diseases. That's about all I remember of that. <laughs> um, but it just, you know, I just, after doing that for a year, I decided, well, that wasn't what I want to do anymore, so I made a transition. And I made a transition into the business world. And I convinced an economic consulting firm that biology research and economic research really shared a lot of the same principles. It was good enough to get me through the interview, and I got the job. And then kind of my career progressed on through business that way. So you don't know necessarily where the, the path is going to take you, but be open to the different ideas and different things that pop up in your experience. And I think all three of these folks demonstrated that the experiences that you have along the way can help you out in your future career, even if it's not part of a neat path. It may still play into that as you go forward. So I think that's, that's great advice from all three. Um, the other thing that struck me about something, everything you said is that you all said not too long ago you were in their shoes. Um, I kind of feel that way too, except it was a long time ago for me. <laughs> When's about so long ago for there? All right, so Johnny Trent, we got some questions to ask. Is that right? Who's going to be? Do we have some? We're going to take them off the Twitter feed first, or we're going to go to the audience first? Okay, we're going to go to the audience first. So, who's got questions for me? For any of our panelists? Yes. You know, I would love to see that. In fact, one of the things I'm working on right now that's not directly on point with that, but I could absolutely see expanding into that, is I've put aside in my budget for the next biennium uh, $250,000 in each of the next two years to start a pilot program working with the private sector. It's based on what Michigan has done. Michigan's program is called the Michigan Advanced Technical Training Program. And in that program, private companies work with school districts to help develop a curriculum and they actually pay high school kids part-time in high school, pay for their post-secondary education, and then hire them directly out of that, kind of creating a pipeline for people who want to go into the skilled labor force. And I would actually like to see that move into the middle school or junior high years. And therefore, I kind of create that kind of complete program. And I can absolutely see this working with ag-related companies as well to help really kind of influence that curriculum based on what the individual school wants to do to really incorporate that into it rather than just making it a one-off where we, you know, we're having a guest speaker today. So I could absolutely see if you're working with an ag company in an individual school district, that absolutely plays out. But as you know, our state's largest uh, industry, I would absolutely like to see that play into it. And I think that's important for a couple of other reasons too. You know, I, my, my grandpa was a farmer. And so I remember going to his farm. But fewer and fewer people here in the state, even in Nebraska, have that direct connection back to agriculture. And that is our, our biggest industry here in the state. That's what drives our economy. So it's important that people all across the state understand that. And so I think that for folks in agriculture, it's really important to look for those opportunities for how we can educate the rest of the state, and just starting with Link, people in Lincoln and Omaha, about where food comes from what a great job our farmers and ranchers do as stewards of the land, how they take care of the animals, for instance, and so forth, helping get people all across the state, not just people who are interested in agriculture, giving them an understanding of how agriculture works. So, you know, again, I would encourage, again, education in the state is local. One of the issues I certainly hear from teachers, they feel like they're test teaching to the test, so we've got some things to do to be able to address that. But, you know, get involved with your school boards and help make sure that education is the one that we need to be having in your local school district because that is where it's going to be driven. And certainly we can do things at the state level, but I'm a big believer in local control. Working with your local school boards is a great way to be able to do it. And frankly, I think if young people like you showed up at school board meetings, those people in the school would be shocked. They wouldn't know what to do. And so you would have a voice because people would want to listen to you. Oh, okay. I should repeat the question, though. The question was for the people online about teaching agriculture in our schools rather than just having one-offs as far as uh, speakers or something like that. So for our next speaker, though, we will have a, uh, our next question, we'll have a speaker or a microphone so they can ask a question. Okay, we've got one over here. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Michelle Henry, and I just want to thank you for coming to talk to us today. And my question is for you, Pete. I was wondering, um, so what is your stance um, on groups of HSUS and PETA um, trying to get their foot in the door coming into our state? Yeah, thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, the last governor had a very firm stance against HSUS, and I plan to continue that stance. Uh, HSUS is not an organization that is about taking care of animals. It's really about changing our way of life here in Nebraska. Uh, they don't have our best interests at heart. They've got an agenda to do away with animal agriculture in particular, and there is no need to have them here in Nebraska as far as I'm concerned, and PETA is an organization very much like that. So I will continue to make sure I work with our producers here in the state to stand up for our producers here in Nebraska and the things we're doing, as I mentioned, our producers do a wonderful job as stewards of the land. They take care of their animals. And HSUS has an agenda that is driven entirely differently from what we want to do here in the state as far as our way of life and how we want to grow agriculture. Other questions? Oh, we got one over here. I'm Molly Hagee. I believe that um, a very important essential part of farming is having services being available and accessible quickly. What is your plan for providing those services to farmers that are away from where the services are located currently? Sure. So Molly, uh, do you have some specific ones you're thinking about? Because I've got some ideas. When you ask that question, I've got some ideas about what I'm thinking about, but I want to make sure I'm hitting upon what you're thinking um, about. Just, you, like you know, health care and things like that? or Exactly. And just, you know, being able to buy equipment, you know, access to the courthouses, just things like that, keeping everything close enough for them to be able to access. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so when I talk to young people who are maybe just a little bit older than you, when they're thinking about whether they're going to stay in their hometown or whether they're going to move back to their hometown after school, the things that kind of get broken down into, and this is kind of confirmed by people I've talked to in our economic development areas, Generally, you have to have a job for both spouses, so that's key. Generally, it's a connection to family. And then the other big key is quality of life issues, which is kind of what you're talking about there. Making sure you've got access to health care, shopping, restaurants. You were talking about just being able to you know, purchase the things you need to have on a farm. So when we're looking at how we grow Nebraska, we have to grow the entire state. You know, we can't be a healthy state if we're only growing Lincoln and Omaha. And so if you look at some of my policies, I'm fo you know, I put out a plan for growing agriculture. I also put out a plan for growing manufacturing. You know, obviously we know we're a big ag state. Manufacturing is our second biggest industry. And manufacturing also has the opportunity to create jobs all across the state. You know, I think about Parent Manufacturing and Alliance or Orthman and Lexington. Deschler uh, has Reinke Manufacturing. And you, let's just take Reinke there. You know, Reinke Manufacturing employs 600 people in the town of Deschler, which has got 800 people. You know, it drives a lot of the economy there. So making sure we have that economic base is how we help make all those other things sustainable. If you've got a job at Reinke and you've got health care benefits, well, guess what? The hospital knows they're going to get paid. So we have to make sure that we've got that solid economic base, which is why I focus on agriculture and manufacturing to make sure we grow the entire state and put in policies that are going to help us do that. In fact, one of the things I did oh, almost 15 months ago now is I put together an ag advisory team made up of ag and business leaders from all across the state to help advise me on agricultural policies. Like I said, my grandpa was a farmer, but I wasn't in the ag field. So I wanted to get that advice on what we could do. We, I actually put out a plan for growing agriculture. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's light reading. It's only like 18 pages long or something like that. But it gives you an overview of where I want to go with my administration and the things that are going to be important to make sure we grow agriculture. Manufacturing is a part of that as well because, again, it, if you've got those great paying jobs that help make sure you've got health care, it supports the coffee shop and things like that, that's important. Other things we do at the state, make sure we've got a good roads infrastructure. You know, whether we're talking about agricultural products or manufactured goods, we have to be able to get our products to market. So I'm doing a national job search to find somebody to be the director of roads to make sure we're doing the best job we can with regard to how we construct roads, how we finance, how we work with the federal government to make sure we're flexible on that. Supporting the Universal Service Fund to make sure we've got broadband internet access all across the state. That helps build that out. That's another key part of it. 
supporting critical access hospitals to make sure they're getting the proper reimbursement so they can stay open. We've got 65 critical access hospitals here across the state. So we want to make sure we continue to have those so people have access to health care. So there's not a single silver bullet thing we have to do. It's a package of all these things that really help create that overall, you know, place where people want to be that allow us to grow not just Lincoln and Omaha, but the entire state. So as you can see, there's a lot of different moving parts here. But what we're trying to do in my administration is address all those things so we keep pushing forward and making progress on those so that if you want to stay in your hometown, you have the opportunity to be able to do that. Got a question right here? And now don't forget, we got three panelists up here too. You don't have to ask me, just, just me questions. Okay, well, to anybody. My name is Megan <laughs> Balin. I'm from Southeast Community College, and I was wondering what your view on cooperatives were and if there was a need for more non-ag cooperatives within smaller towns like grocery stores, stuff like that. Well, you know what, actually, since we have somebody who works for uh, a, a cooperative, I'm going to turn it over to you, John, and have you start by answering that. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, so cooperatives is pretty unique, right? Because uh, what's interesting about cooperatives that a lot of people don't know is that the members are the owners of it. So if you do business with, say, Frontier Co-op, for example, or another co-op in the state of Nebraska, you, uh, you now are a member and an owner of that co-op. So you have a piece of voting stock. So it's pretty unique business compared to a, a private business. Um, the part where you were asking questions, I had, uh, when I was in college, I was uh, part of a group that was a college conference on cooperatives in the Twin Cities. And it was pretty unique because it helped me really think outside of just the ag. Um, so to answer your question, there is some uh, cooperatives that uh, are in the state of Nebraska that are not just ag related. But as far as grocery ones, I don't think we have any in the state, do we? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think we do, but. Oh, there's one in Valentine. Oh, Cody, oh, you're talking about the yes. Simple K. Yeah. You are right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. There is one, I apologize. But, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a cooperative, uh, um, you know, it, ag in Nebraska is the biggest, but when you go to other states and stuff, there's, there's other grocery co-ops and stuff like that. So. Yeah, and you know, um, actually, that, and that Circle K in Cody is a great example of one where uh, Cody is like 39 miles from Valentine, and they lost their grocery store, and so they felt like they wanted to have that, and so it was actually a high school project. And so they got the high school together, they got the school board on board, they got the community on board, they built it, and Greg, help me out, what's the, what's the building called? It's, it's uh, hay bale insulated. Right. Yeah, well, there's a name for it that's really easy. It's probably like a hay bale building or something. But it's really, uh, but it's an innovative kind of design, and the, the, actually the high school kids actually run it. They get, they get the opportunity to be able to come in. They're the ones that are doing the purchasing. They're the ones keeping the books. They do have the principal that's overseeing all of it, but it's really a fantastic opportunity. And I think that's a great example of how you could expand that across the state, just like they have it in other states. So uh, I think there's lots of opportunities for that. Again, it, I, I would say the thing that it requires is leadership. Somebody who wants to come together to pull together those ideas. And in that case, it was the high school kids who decided they wanted to demonstrate that leadership of, hey, we see a problem here in our, our town. We want to do something about it. So. Can we take one of the questions off of the, uh, the Twitter feed? Can we do that? Who's got a microphone to be able to, to pull one off? Who wants to pull one off? Who wants to read one? Here you go, Will. <laughs> um, Morgan Zum's question. What is one thing that you wish you would have known when you were our age? For probably everyone. You know what? Uh, that's a great one. So why don't we start with you, Austin? We'll just kind of go down the line. What's one thing you wish you knew when you were in college or high school? I guess one thing that I wish I would have known that I kind of grew to, to know or learned, I guess, along the way was how many different opportunities within ag there are. I mean, <clears throat> you don't have to be just a farmer. There's nothing wrong about farmers either. I mean, I still feel like I work for those guys in my position, but there's so many different opportunities if that isn't for you. You know, within agriculture, you know, there's different routes for everybody. Uh, to stay involved within agriculture and make an impact, I guess. Um, one thing I would say, can you hear me? One thing I would say is if you see a job that's very interesting to you and maybe they don't offer an internship, 
you can always ask to go shadow them for a day or just have them be your mentor because there's a lot of companies that don't have the budget to offer an internship and they might have the best job in the world and you want to be in that position someday and so to really understand what they do and see if you could do that someday and see yourself in their shoes I would recommend reaching out and everyone I mean they're always open to let you come in and shadow and so I wish I would have known about that uh, the biggest thing for me is I graduated high school in 2000 so agriculture in the state of Nebraska at that time was a uh, was pretty tough there were some droughts going on and and financially it was pretty tough so everyone was just saying get away from the farm as far as you can get away you know agriculture um, that advice you know when I think back on that that's not what I tell kids or, or right now students that are your age uh, the thing that I tell people is you know agriculture is so much more than just farming there's if you look at the state of Nebraska and how many jobs are tied back to the ag industry and not only Nebraska, you look outside of that, there's a lot. There's a lot of us that make really good livings off of it. And so the thing that I would say is I wish I would have known so I could have positive, positively excuse me, been talking to not only uh, people that I ran into at school, but also my peers and uh, other college classmates and stuff. Yeah, and I, I guess if uh, I would want to build maybe a little bit what Emily's talked about as well, people are really willing to help you. If you just pick up the phone and talk to somebody, I bet you're gonna find, no matter who you talk to, they're willing to do something for you. Because generally, you know, people who are in industry want to be able to help young people get into that industry, get into that job. And so I think Emily's comment is really relevant. And the other thing, too, to really consider is that you know, getting a job is a lot about networking. It's about talking to people. Again, it's hard to like necessarily lay out a plan, especially at your age, about exactly where do you want to be in the next two, three, five, ten years. But if you're networking with a lot of different people, you're keeping your options open, and you never know when that's going to connect with something that will be the job you want to do, maybe for a career. And so I would encourage you all just to find those mentors, find those people who are in the industry you may be interested in, or just somebody you like who you can talk to and get advice from because I think you're going to find that most people are going to be willing want to spend the time with you to help you plan your career. You just got to ask. And that, you know, a lot of life is just showing up. So show up because that makes a huge difference. Yeah, we're going to... My name is Dylan Dom, and my question is for everyone, um, for the three panelists in your companies and for Governor Ricketts in your administration, what plans do you have for increasing consumer awareness and understanding of biotechnology? Austin? Oh, we should change that. We should make John go first, shouldn't we? You also went first last time. Put the pressure on John. That's a, that's a great question to ask. It, when I was talking to you guys earlier, uh, one comment that I made is I recently hired a marketing coordinator. And as far as in the uh, co-op industry, in the ag co-op industry, that is something that you don't hear a lot about. Um, and actually, it kind of scared my GM and the board of directors when I first brought that to them. They're like, marketing, what are you talking about marketing? And it, uh, so the way it kind of came about like that is it's our job to make sure that we're getting uh, our voice out there in the schools, the, the question earlier was asking about, you know, education in the schools. We do a lot with getting into the schools and talking about um, agriculture as a whole, not just the bio side, but also as a whole. And I think that's important because if we can educate people, Lincoln, Omaha, kids in the schools, um, I think that's a big part to uh, helping with the awareness. So this is a big part of my job, and I mean, that one issue can be very widespread. And so at the Nebraska Corn Board, um, we work with a lot of partners to address this issue. And within the state, I mean, we address this, but then on a national level as well. And so we work with a lot of national cooperators that have a lot more staff, and they're solely focused on addressing whatever 
consumer issue it might be um, and misperceptions that are out there. So U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, that's a big one that's out there and trying to help educate and get the word out. For a long time, the ag community in general just kind of sat back and we weren't out there in front of people talking about what we do, talking about the safety of our products and the food we produce. And then all of a sudden you have a lot of anti-agriculture groups that are coming up and being, being really vocal and just riding that wave of emotion that really connects with people who don't quite understand agriculture. And like I said, this could be on a variety of different topics. So I think Nebraska Corn Board and Ag in general, we're doing a lot better job of like he said, getting out in front of people and communicating about what we're doing and then also riding on that wave of emotion too because that's what people connect with. And just from farmer to farmer, showing them what we're doing and that our products are safe and that biotechnology, GMOs, that stuff is not scary and it's not harmful. So that's kind of what we're doing. I guess from my company we have uh, with GSI, you know, it's a little bit different perspective because you know, we're more on the manufacturing side with the equipment and, and things like that. So, yes, we work with a lot of people, and one of the big parts about that is safety of our stuff and safety on the farm. You know, safety within grain bins, safety around equipment, uh, several things with that. Our company has done several different uh, conferences, I guess you could say, uh, teaching the safety around this equipment and teaching the safety around grain bins trying to get the word out about how to be safer around everything. And I think that's kind of one of the bigger perspectives from, from my side of thing on the manu manufacturing side of things. Yeah. yeah, I think that, and then just to, to build on that, I think it's not just biotechnology, I think it's all agriculture. Kind of the comments we were talking before about from the first question about education is trying to make sure we're educating people in the state about what does, where does your, your food come from? Because a lot of people just don't know. Uh, one of the other issues I think is kind of related to that, first of all, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we have the Ag Conference, to help share these ideas and also highlight agriculture. So it's not just this Ag Conference we're doing here with the, for the governor is not just about the people in the industry, but we also use it as an opportunity to try and educate people outside of agriculture about what's going on here in Nebraska. So that's one of the opportunities. Uh, I think there's also uh, things we need to do, that, like Farmland, the movie, if you've seen that or maybe you've heard some clips about it. That's a great way to educate people outside of agriculture about what it means to be a producer. And so that, those things are important. And certainly it's going to be one of the things that I do as I travel around the state is talk about the importance of agriculture to Nebraska, Nebraskans to help educate them. Uh, also, um, you know, Director Eibach and I will be going to trade missions to help educate people overseas about the quality of the products we have here. So there's not going to be, again, a single uh, silver bullet thing we have to do, but all of us helping to educate our friends, neighbors, people outside the state about agriculture are going to be very important to our success in the future because if we don't do that communication, if we don't talk, as Emily was saying, about you know, what does it mean to, to have something that's a GMO, somebody else is going to step in and fill that vacuum and they're going to talk about it and they're not going to have our interests at heart. They're going to talk about it from their agenda, and that's probably going to be some extremist environmentalist you know, who doesn't understand what it means to actually, where their food actually comes from. That's why we have to do a good job here in the state telling our story. Here's Director, can you read it for me, please? I don't have my reading glasses. Yeah, that's what happens you get old. Laugh, laugh now, but it's going to happen so, to you. Uh, this uh, comes from the internet from Jed Hofschneider. What are your plans for tax reform and specifically property tax reform? So what are my plans for tax reform and specifically property tax reform? Is that somebody we planted on the internet? <laughs> Jed's sitting back there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's back there. You thought you could short circuit it by, okay, good. Um, that's a smart guy. Pay attention to that guy. Uh, so specifically, as I've gotten around the state, you know, we're a high tax state, and that's one of the issues we face here in Nebraska. We've got to bring those taxes down. And in particular, as I've traveled the state from Alliance to Syracuse, property taxes are the number one issue. And so that is, I'm making that a priority for my first session here, working with Unicameral, is to work on property taxes. Now in my budget, I've set aside $60 million a year in a, uh, additional into the property tax credit relief fund. That's uh, actually nearly a 43% increase on the money that was already in there and would make the total for the next two-year period 
uh, $400 million in direct property tax relief. And so that, what that property tax credit relief fund is, is that's a pool of money from the state that we pay directly to all property owners across the state. And it gets reflected on their property tax bills. So you'd see that directly. Nobody gets in the way of that. That is a direct credit back to every property owner in the state. So that's one of the things I'm doing for property tax relief. I've also proposed taking valuations on ag land down from 75% to 65%. And because that means we'd have to put money into the school aid formula over and above what we'd ordinarily put in, I budgeted for that as well. So I put in $9.5 million in the second year of the biennium and bringing that up to an additional $10 and $20 million to get up to a total of $30 million three years out. Uh, that's how I've proposed phasing that in is over the course of three years. Now, I view that as the start of the conversation on property taxes, not the end. There are 26 bills that have been uh, put in the legislature just this session on property tax relief. The Revenue Committee right now is taking all these ideas and working on them. Uh, I will plan on sitting down with, uh, I've already sat down with Chairman Gore once and we'll, uh, he's the chair of the Revenue Committee and sit down with him uh, additionally to talk about what he would like to see come out of that committee. Uh, the way it works is you've got seven members on that committee. They've got, got to get at least four votes to get a bill out of that committee onto the floor. And then, of course, you've got to get it passed on the floor of the legislature. So there's a legislative process that goes on with this. Um, so that's what we're doing right now with regard to property tax. The key, though, for any sort of tax relief in the state is going to be controlling expenses. Our revenues in this state, our tax revenues grow about 5% a year on average over the last 20 years. My budget recommendation has us growing expenses at 3.1% over the next biennium. That difference is how you get tax relief. And we have to do that for a sustained period of time. And just to me, let me contrast that with the last biennium that we're just finishing up. So, you know, we pass a budget for two years at a time. The budget year, the biennium that we're just finishing up will end June 30th. And for that biennium, ending June 30th of this year, we will have raised expenses 6.5%. We grew government 6.5%, and our revenues only grew 5.4%. Now, I don't know how many math majors we have in here, but it doesn't take a math major to figure out you can't do that sustainably long term. You can't do it in your household, you can't do it in your business, and we can't do it in state government. And we certainly got to flip that around if we're going to get tax relief. And so that's going to be one of my priorities as governor is to really focus on controlling that growth of government, really ratcheting that back to give us the room to have that tax relief. Anybody on the panel want to talk about tax relief? <laughs> you covered it pretty good. No, you got, I got it good? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Austin. All right, let's take another one from the audience here. Yeah. And by the way, Emily, we're starting with you this time. Okay. You've been warned. Hi, I'm Olivia Fiella. I'm from Ulysses, Nebraska, so I live on a far small farm, and I know that the input for farmers are, is constantly going up. For a college person who's coming straight out of college, which has debt and stuff, how do you plan on decreasing that so it's a little bit easier for them to get into the agricultural business? All right, Emily, what do you got on that one? <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, actually looking at the rising cost of education is certainly one of the issues we face here in the state as well. Uh, at the University of Nebraska, we are getting a new president, Dr. Hank Bounds. He's coming to us from Mississippi. I've had a chance to talk to him. He's, uh, well, I was going to say young man. He's in his 40s. That probably sounds old to you. But um, he is somebody who I think has got a lot of vision and energy. And I look forward to working with him to focus on what we want to become world class on at the University of Nebraska. I mean, the way you're successful in any business is not trying to be all things to all people. You gotta focus on your customers, what are you gonna be really good at, and serve that customer. And education is the same way. You know, you think about the University of Missouri. They're known for being world class in journalism. People from all around the world go to the University of Missouri to study journalism because they're known for being world class. Well, we need to do the same thing here in Nebraska. The University of Nebraska needs to be known for being world class and of course, getting back to what's our largest industry? Agriculture. So it needs to be along those lines. Now, we are doing that in many ways. We've got the Water for Food Institute, we've got the Rural Futures Institute, so I think the University of Nebraska is doing the things to say, we're gonna focus on the things that are important to the state like agriculture. We need to continue to build upon that, and that's one of the ways that if we focus on the things that we really wanna be good at, 
and we say those other things, they're going to kind of fall to the side. We're not going to spend the resources on that. That's how we control that, that cost of education and how quickly that is going up. So that's what I look to forward to working with Dr. Bounds on. When he arrives here, he actually arrives next month to be able to start working on to figure out how do we tackle that to make sure, because just like uh, with the university, you know, with gov government rather, we have to do the same at the university. We have to control those expenses. So and again, my budget recommendation, I put in a 3% increase for their budget, just like we're doing for state government. I'm expecting them to be able to be good stewards of the resources and do the same thing I'm doing in state government, which is go through the budget line by line, look for the things that are going to focus on the things we have to do, and the other stuff we're just not going to spend the money on, and that's how you keep expenses down. Um, hi, I'm Amanda Kowaleski, and you guys have all talked a lot about educating youth about agriculture. However, there's a shortage of ag teachers, especially in Nebraska. I was wondering what your thoughts are on encouraging um, college and high school age students to pursue a career in agriculture education. All right, Emily, you're, you're up. We told you. Do you want me to go first? <laughs> I'll comment on this one first, and the reason I can is uh, ag teachers are really important. They're really important for people that are in my position because uh, you guys are the students that we are going to be hiring within the next few years. So it's very important that we have teachers that are educating students about agriculture and also being prepared for when you do get out of school. Um, so just a little bit, something that uh, at Frontier Co-op, what we have done is recently I went into a fairly good-sized school, into a C1 school. And I went to them, and they do not have FFA. And I'm a big supporter of FFA. I'm an alum. Um, I'll be at the state convention here coming up in a month or whatever, helping judge. And I went into them, and I met with the board and the principal and the superintendent. And I presented to them, and I said, as Frontier Co-op, I will guarantee you X amount of dollars for the next five years to contribute to getting this program up. But you have to, have, you have to bring in a teacher that's qualified. They have to have all their certificates and they have to actively participate in all the stuff in the surrounding counties with the students or, or around in that county where that school is located. So that's something that, that we've done to try and promote that. Um, definitely a big challenge though. I'm surprised they didn't jump on it right away. It's still a work in progress. And I thought for sure when I committed dollars, I thought they would be all over it. So anyway, it's a great challenge and it's important. There was a comment that Governor Ricketts made earlier. I took some students with me to the second board meeting. I highly recommend that, that if you guys walk in there to that high school board, they're not gonna even know what to think. They're just totally caught off guard. So that's something in your shoes, I think you actually have a lot more voice and a lot more power than any of us do in our positions. So everything he just said, I would say the same. <laughs> but, um, I think we need more companies like Frontier Co-op that can put up money like that and help get FFA programs and ag-based programs started in schools. Um, there is a lot that do not offer ag-based programs, but if they don't, if they can't offer FFA, another thing, I think we spoke to it earlier, was just ag literacy and getting that into school as schools as well, because you don't have to be a teacher that's solely focused on agriculture, but if you can somehow bring that into your curriculum, I think that's really important in starting all the way kindergarten and up through 12th grade. And so I know that's a big thing that the university and a lot of the commodity groups is working on is creating one central place with ag literacy for every commodity group and agriculture in general. So I think we're heading in the right direction, but like you said, you guys are big voices too, so keep supporting too. And as you look into career paths, I mean, keep that in mind as becoming an ag teacher also. Well, I'm not gonna try and beat a dead horse here, but you know, if, I think if our companies within the communities really help support and, and press the issue with the school within the community. I think that that would help greatly. Uh, you know, then they see more of a demand. Why, why do we need, you know, an ag teacher around here? You know, it, if they show that there's a need for the jobs, there's a need for students to be interested in ag and to keep them interested, I think that'll help, help quite a bit. And then also on your part, you know, just like they said, if you guys show interest and, and, and show them that there is a high interest within the school, I think that will help press them to, you know, push push forward 
to get something with ag in, involved in the school. Yeah, and I, I would just highlight that as well. I think that that's great advice. That it, if there's a demand for it, then schools start looking for it, then you'll see people start following in those careers. So I would uh, think that's a great advice. And then also just getting back to what I talked about before, trying to find private sector companies to work, as John was talking about, with school districts to be able to help develop that curriculum and showing that there are private, there's private sector interest and dollars that go along with that is, again, one of the ideas I had behind what I was talking about and what John's doing there. I think that's a great way to kind of help push that along as well. All right, so we've been hitting that side of the room a lot. We'll go back over here, and then we'll go to the internet. Yes. So Greg, you'll look for another, another one. Okay. I'm Alex Malmkar. I'm from SEC. Um, the, there was somebody that touched on it a little bit on property and land taxes, and we're seeing an increase in that. I know that we have a small farm, and we pay a lot of money in that. One thing I'm looking at is uh, death tax or inheritance tax. There's been a lot of talk about that lately and how the president wants to lower that and increase the amount that we get taxed on. I don't know where you see that as the future because that's kind of a big problem for us because I don't really want to be paying 40 percent of my, you know, of my farm if I'm just getting started. So where do you see that going? Sure. So the question with regard to, well, actually, I don't want to jump in. Do you all want to talk about inheritance taxes? You're, you're all got, you're good with me taking this one? Okay, good. Um, so it certainly uh, one of the in impacts in inheritance tax, I think what you'll see is that there's two different, there's a, the state level and there's the federal level. At the state level, if you're a direct line, if you're a son or a daughter, it's not going to be a big deal. If you're getting out of that direct line, then it becomes a big deal. Uh, at the federal level, that's, again, something that we're not going to have as much control over, but it is going to be something that I think is, is, is a damper on the economy. So I'm not a big fan of the uh, inheritance tax or the death tax, but frankly, right now, my priorities are around property tax, starting with that, and then uh, moving on to income tax. One of the issues we have when it comes to the inheritance tax is your counties use that, so we don't collect at the state level, okay? The counties are the ones that collect it. And what they do is they, they can't, well, they can't certainly forecast it directly. What they do is they use that to kind of fill in gaps in their budgets. So if we were going to do something with inheritance on the state level here, uh, we would have to see uh, what we were going to do to make sure we weren't disrupting counties' budgets because you want to be thoughtful just because uh, we don't want to make sure we create undue hardships for them. So we'd have to think about how that would all interplay if we did it away with it at the state level. At the federal level, uh, Frankly, I actually wouldn't see a lot of movement on this just because uh, you've got a, a Republican Congress and a Democrat executive branch, and I just don't know if they're going to get together to work on that. I could be wrong. i got to tell you, I just really haven't followed it that quickly or that closely. So, Greg, we got time for one more? One more. We'll have one last one from uh, Twitter, and it's uh, how can our generation help to clear up the misconceptions about agriculture that are out there? Okay, so the question was, how can your generation, thank goodness, pressure's off me now, uh, help clear up some of the misconceptions about agriculture? And I think that, first of all, just all the things we've talked about today really kind of play into that, about how important it is to communicate. I think that if you look at agriculture as an industry, there was a lot of perception that agriculture didn't do a lot of communicating out, that people just kind of knew where food came from. And certainly, Generations ago, that was true, but that's not true anymore. And so all the things that we have to do with all the different things we've got going on at the state level, all the different outside groups, what Emily's doing on the Corn Board, those are all important to making sure we tell our story in agriculture. It's important for our state. And so I would actually challenge and put it all back on you to figure out what can you do to help communicate that out to the people that you know, to the people that are in your communities, to make sure that they know what a great job our, our producers do in this state, how they're great stewards of the land, how they intend to pass it on to the family generation so they want to make sure they're doing a good job of taking care of it from an environmental standpoint, that the, the food we're getting is the, most, is the safest, it's low cost. All those things are important to help educate people that aren't directly related to agriculture, to let them know. Actually, and then Emily, I will go back to you since this is kind of what you do for a living. To talk about uh, some of those, some of the specifics on that. Well, I think, I mean, 
he basically said everything I wanted to say and better, um, but your story, telling your story, that's the key to getting our message out there. And I know you all have, what, thousands and thousands of friends on social media, and I'm guessing not all of them are from the same background as you. So just like he said, getting out there and telling your story, whether it's an egg fact for the week or just talking about maybe planting season, for example, and sharing on Facebook and your social media platforms the process of corn growing or whatever it might be, but just sharing your story, whether it's on a crop side or livestock side, um, it really is influential and people do see it. And you're someone they relate to, so they're like, oh, my friend, they're from a cattle farm, I didn't know that. And all of a sudden they're making that connection and they, they trust you and they see it more on a level that they can connect with. So it is important, you guys are all really important part of this movement and us getting out there and telling our story. So if you see something that the corn board tweets out, retweet it or anything like that will be helpful. And so just keep it up and keep telling your message. Yeah, and I, I just want to build on something Emily just said there because I think that's really key. She talked about how you're personal. There's, there are people that you, you know, that you, if you tweet that out to the people that know you, they're like, oh, I know that person. And that's key because Drug Tribal can put out a ton of press releases, but your personal story is going to be way more impactful to even people who don't know you. It's putting that human face on it that is so critical that we have to do that people outside of agriculture have got to know that there's actually people in agriculture. You know, one of the things, uh, for instance, I think it was last year sometime, was that Chipotle had the game where they had the faceless, you know, corporate farmer. You know, it completely doesn't represent agriculture. But that's the kind of image that is out there by people who don't understand. So you getting out, reaching out, and putting that, that personal touch, that human face, is going to do way more for helping to convince and, act and educate people about agriculture than anything Director Ibach could do through a press release because it's your personal story. And that's really what we need if we want to educate people, is it's got to be that personal, it's got to be local, it's got to be human. And that's how you have effective communication. So uh, that was a great question, Greg. Thanks for picking that one off. And thank you on Twitter, whoever asked, asked that. Uh, I think it's about 3 o'clock, and I want to be sensitive to everybody's time here, so I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Can we give a big hand of applause to our panelists up here, please? And actually, uh, I'm going to uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule. So we have a, a little parting gift here for your participation today. We appreciate it very much. And uh, thank you all very much for uh, taking the time out of your day to be able to come and talk about these important issues and your interest in agriculture because, again, that is going to be the future of our state. And thank you very much to uh, everybody to, who joined us online as well to follow us on uh, the Internet. Appreciate uh, you taking your time to follow us here because I know it's not as fun and interactive when you're uh, looking at uh, over uh, the Internet, but we appreciate their participation as well. So thank you all and have a great afternoon. <laughs>